everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and a very warm welcome to colleagues, to winners, to teachers, to this, the 18th year, our coming of age of the Elton's Innovation Awards. I'm Stevie Spring, I'm the chairman of the British Council, but a failed English language teacher, or rather an aspiring English language teacher, it's never too late. It was my ambition at school to teach English and sport, and I ended up as a lawyer and then as a media bod. Uh, but as I said, it's never too late. So it really is both an honour and a pleasure to welcome you all to the 2020 Eltons. I'm told that these are the Oscars of our industry, so I've got a new dress specially. Um, well, actually I bought it in March, uh, but this is its first outing because we haven't been allowed out. And even though we're together online only today celebrating innovation and the teams and the individuals behind it, uh, and online only means you can only see my top half new frock. Um, I thought it was uh, worth an outing. Um, luckily you can't see the comfy slippers that I'm wearing underneath the desk and that's the liberation of zooming um, so yes this is the year our events our celebrations our offices our meetings and classrooms have all moved into our homes so we're all living through a boom in meeting and learning together online and necessity really is the mother of invention as the english proverb goes all the trends in education have been turbocharged by COVID restrictions. Remote learning's the new normal and the flipped cast classroom came into its element. Um, now I spent 30 years in the creative industries, so I'm delighted to be here with a global community of creators today. You've all seen a need, a problem that people had in the world, and you've put in an enormous amount of time and creative effort and indeed cash to help solve the problems. All the innovations we celebrate here today were submitted before the pandemic, but it's almost as if they were tailor made for these unpredictable times. Among them, we find help for students to become really well-rounded citizens, not only to communicate well in English, but to learn essential life skills like empathy, awareness of their emotions, their societies and of other cultures along the way. And many of our finalists are helping teachers put learning back into student hands so that the learners can follow their, their own curiosities, reflect on their progress as they go, and really learn how to learn independently. Now, here at the British Council, like you, we've tried hard during the crisis to be a force for good in the lives of English language teachers and learners. During the peak of national lockdowns around the world, back in March, five and a half million adults and teenagers and kids and parents used our Learn English website. That's more than 250% more than March last year. In a matter of just weeks, we moved 85,000 students in 44 different countries from teaching centre bases to learning English online, as I said, turbocharging what was already being piloted. The new ways of doing things online, of connecting, of coping, teaching and learning, they will now stick around for good. But we have to recognise that access is not the same for everyone. Yes, half the world, nearly 59% is online, but that still leaves almost half of the global population who don't have access to the technology that has allowed the rest of us to continue life connected. 
And that's why our frontline teams worked with local media partners in television, in radio, and indeed in print to take our English language learning content into nearly 12 million homes around the world that could not access online. We're all in this together, as everybody keeps saying, but we are not all in this together equally. For many, the crisis has removed the safe environments that schools provide. And for many of the 15% or so of us who live with a disability, they are proportionately affected by this, disproportionately affected, I should say, by, by the so-called digital divide. So to mark this Elton, the 18th anniversary Eltons, today we're proud to announce the recipients of an inaugural commendation for equality, diversity and inclusion. The finalists in this all demonstrated serious efforts to bridge inequality in education, to reflect diversity, and to include groups often excluded in English language teaching. Only last week, we celebrated World Teachers Day, just as many schools around the world returned to classroom teaching and a timely reason for cheer and a timely theme, the UNESCO theme this year is teachers leading in crisis, imagining the future. Our own global community of English language educators, many of you joining us today, have all adapted at lightning pace, all gone the extra mile to limit disruption to our students' education. Some of you have been getting to grips with teaching your classes online at the same time as trying to teach your own children at home. Some of you have taught classes right before this event and some of you will go straight back into another class after it and all while dealing with the extra anxiety, the extra stress, the extra uncertainty, balancing life at home with worries about families, and your elders and your young people, and I absolutely salute you all. So what I'd like to do is actually to raise a toast to celebrate this wonderful global community. So please charge your glasses and join me in a virtual toast to raise our glasses around the world and say here's to the great profession of English language teaching, the professionals in it and the industry around it. So to the strength and courage of teachers and students and parents, to the creativity and ingenuity of people finding new ways to teach and to learn and to finding new ways to connect with each other and to learn from each other across borders despite the challenges, just as we're all doing today. So a toast to us all. Cheers. Being rather pleasant. Hmm. So it is now my great pleasure to share a poem written especially for the 2020 Eltons. It was written by the number one best-selling UK poet, Sophia do not forget, not even for a second, that you own the flesh that pushes against your skin in a constant rhythm, reminding you to dance with life. Even when the kiss of a warmer climate slowly migrates from tinted cheeks and winter, wherever you are, pulls your palette under its icy paintbrush. I hope that you were smart enough to lock at least a fistful of sun behind your ribs. I hope you blinked a Santorini sunset deep into your face to be seen again on the inside of your lids. If ever, that is, you should hope to remember how beautiful a life it is 
when we spread our laughter across plate boundaries like a tide, pulling the world closer, despite humans' best efforts to scratch cracks across the globe. I hope you know that like dust, what sits under these fault lines is only a breath of fresh air, something new to experience, something to add to our collection of feelings. Yes, across the stretch of the clouds underneath we are different, but how marvelous it is to move 500 miles and still throw chins to the stars and marvel at how moving the sky can be when performed to the faint sound of a new language. A new laugh pulls from your lips into your living room, rebounding off the laptop screen to be laughed again as you watch your holiday archives. And you again wonder, who on earth told you that that hat goes with that dress? But there is something about unfolding ourselves into maps to be stamped like passports by new ways of thinking and living and eating and dressing and drinking and opening to how many ways a country can stain your skin. Okay, sure, right now we're locked in, but luckily we're in the age of smartphones. So go to your holiday album, print out some photos, watch a telenovela, try to sing along to the intro, switch over to Nollywood, see some West African clothes, maybe order some jollof or gizzard, close the curtain, ignore the blizzard, T turn your heating up and pretend to be by the coast, tuck your toes into a throw and change the way that you scroll. Maybe like a few photos from friends that you met on the road. Follow it up by calling their phone, send voice notes instead of messages. Remember how their voice would croak when they spoke. Use words instead of emojis. Find a way to express those feels. Although we're becoming more intimate with the internet, we can't afford to swap flesh for steer. Balance the news with documentaries, then turn them both off and read a book. <laughs> Close those pages and take a look at the sky. And as you take a look at the sky, trust. Trust that across 1,000 miles, the stars have stolen over 7 billion eyes. And despite distance and difference, we all smile at the same sun. Now more than ever before, we must lean into that connection to protect whoever humanity decides to become. Oh my gosh, intimate despite the internet, because we all smile at the same sun. How fantastic was that? Thank you, Sophia, for a perfect poem. So uh, finally from me, it now gives me real pleasure to hand you over to the real host of the British Council, Elton's Awards for 2020. He is a broadcaster, a brilliant panelist for, oh gosh, so many BBC TV and radio shows, Saturday Live, Have I Got News For You. He is, in the words of the Carlsberg ads, probably the world's only member of an 80s pop sensation, the wonderful communards. Don't leave me this way. Um, the wonderful communards, who's now chancellor of a university and a Church of England vicar. But according to the government's new skills assessment app, apparently he should be decorating cakes. <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Richard, welcome the Reverend Richard Coles. Uh, Thank you Richard, very much. How Steve. fab was Sophia's poem? On I love connecting? Sophia's poem. I love this idea of pulling the world together when there's so much in the past few months that seemed to threaten to pull us apart. The power of language, the power of the imagination to do that. Wonderful. Just wonderful. And this is a fabulous excuse for us to reconnect. It's been a long old time. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say, it's been made much, much better 
by your marvellously eclectic tweets. Um, <laughs> members of the audience, if you don't follow at Rev Richard Coles, I urge you to do so. You are truly missing out on life affirming. Richard, I'm going to leave the floor to you. It's a pleasure to have you back with us and thank you so much for doing this. So Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Stevie. And it's a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the British Council Elton's Innovation Awards 2020 to everyone who's joining online from homes, offices, schools in Mexico, Brazil, Yemen, India, the United States, Greece, China, Japan, the Philippines, Peru, across the UK's four nations, and of course more. And I'm speaking to you from England, from the parish of Findon in Northamptonshire. You may wonder why on such an international and such a cutting education, a Church of England vicar in a little village in the middle of England, where trees are turning to red and gold, and we live in gingerbread houses, is talking to you different ways of answering that question. But I'd remind you that actually the Christian church uh, provides a template for this. It's one of the great innovators in information technology and globalism. Christianity adopted the codex, the book, that's printed pages bound together in book form. The technology that had been around, but a Christian church was the first to really make use of it. Packed it onto mules, went out along the roads and lanes from the Eastern Mediterranean, around the world, taking the gospel with it, trying to make this uh, account, this extraordinary account of something that had happened, relevant, accessible, comprehensible in all sorts of different languages globally. One of the effects of that, of course, when it arrived in England was the Reformation, contributed to the Reformation. Technology again, printing came in, the Bible was printed, translated into English, into the vernacular, put into the hands of the people, an explosive thing. And that in turn was one of the motors that drove British expansion around the world. One of the seeds that was sown in that, that bore good fruit, not everything did of course, was in fact the British Council. So in a way we stand in a long line that goes right back to that moment when someone bound pages into a book for the first time. So that's part of it. The other part is, as Stevie very generously recalled, was that I was in a pop band uh, in the 1980s, the least likely pop star of that era. My nephew Oliver is um, 17 and is just becoming aware that the um, adults in his life have a backstory. He discovered that I was in a band and he went, oh, Uncle Richard, were you in a band? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, a real band. Yeah, it was. Like, well, you were like on the YouTube. I said, well, we didn't have YouTube then, but he looked me up and he watched a video that I made about 35 years ago. And at the end of it, he turned to me and he said, funny, even then you can tell there was a vicar struggling to get out. So it may seem like quite a distance between pop music in the 1980s and now. But pop music in the 1980s too was an opportunity for us to use new technology to take what we hope is a coherent message out to capture people's imaginations and the idea was was to extend the boundaries of inclusion and diversity it's one of the themes that we're concentrating on the british council this year to get people in to mobilize people's imagination and their creativity to leverage that to create benefits for all the music video there was a piece of new technology all of a sudden you were able to perform without being there due to uh, the miracle of tv and then, of course, through the record, through the download and so on. It's a continuing story, the idea that we mobilise technology in order to spread the word. And the word so often in this case is English, but not a kind of narrow, inward looking, chest beating, tub thumping kind of English, but a kind of English which stands and looks out into the world and embraces it. And in so doing, energises people fosters that creativity, stimulates that imagination, because that is where the solution to the problems that we face today lies. It's in the skills, the creativity and the commitment to be mobilised in people. The challenge is also the opportunity. Now the Eltons is truly international. The British Council received entries from 35 countries from across six continents, Europe, the Americas, Africa, Asia and Oceania. And from this impressive international field, just 29 have made it through as finalists. All the courses, 
books, apps, platforms and projects have been through the judge's most rigorous discernment, a very, very uh, busy and intense process. And not even the judges know who the winners are until now. So let's find out. First of all, this evening is the award for digital innovation. And the theme is kind of learning or not in lockdown. Um, uh, learning independently, online learning, of course, has been a lifesaver, particularly for parents, I think, in this very interesting period uh, when children and students have been at home. Joe Wicks, with his physical jerks, has just been made a member of the British Empire by uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Gamification, too, apps that in encourage um, children and young people to get involved in learning by making them think it's not learning, by making them think it's fun and not a chore practice whenever. One of the things I've done in lockdown, please don't judge me for this, I've learnt the accordion, something I have secretly always wanted to do. There's a famous cartoon of the devil greeting people at the gates of hell and handing each person as they arrive an accordion. Please don't let that put you off. But I've been able to pick that up and just work with that whenever I want. Practice whenever, that is the thing. And of course, using artificial intelligence, ranking words, um, by their utility, helping people to pronounce words properly, showing the areas uh, that are most difficult so you can get more practice. Now the Elton for digital innovation is for first, resources that use new cutting edge technology, or second, the resources which make innovative use of existing technology. And so to present this first award, I'm pleased to welcome Michael Curry. CEO, English School, and a venture partner at Blenheim Chocolate. Thank you, Richard. And hello to all of you joining the Eltons from around the world. I had a good look at the entries some great ideas and execution. Definitely some ones to watch in this cohort. Anyway, I'm pleased to be able to share the finalists and reveal the winner of the Elton for Digital Innovation. Finalists are Busu English Smart Review from Busu, Word Up App from Geeks Limited, Journey to Basic Skills from Click to Learn with City College Glasgow, Learning Sugar from Beijing Educapital Technology, Macmillan Navio from Macmillan Education. Hello, everyone. Okay, good luck, everyone. And the winner is Busu English Smart Review. Second, now, and thankfully, Elton keeps giving me the award. Thank you, Elton. That's very, very good of you. Um, I really didn't, really didn't think that. Um, we had a chance to win this because integrating AI into anything around language learner really means that if it's got machine learning, it's learning from the learner and it's in the background and it's really subtle about what it's doing. So it's great that the judges recognize um, the power of bringing human curated materials together with machine learning. And what I really liked about this project was the collaboration. So we, Boosie's core belief is that we believe amazing things happen when we learn together and combining human interactions, expert creative courses, and smart learning technology, and that's the best way to learn language. Um, and that fusion is also through the teams working together. So working on a smart review was great. We brought together machine learning experts, we brought together language learning experts and all the back end and front end engineers and working together to personalize um, each and every individual's learning journey. So thank you very much. Thanks especially to the team behind this, Fed Espinoza, Hannah Morris, Elena Martin, 
Dr. Stephanie Reynolds, Dr. Tom Richardson, and Celia Pittark. And um, special thanks to the judges. I've been a judge myself previously, not this year, obviously, for um, conflicts of interest, but um, I know how much hard work is involved. And um, so thank you. It's nice to be on the receiving end this time. Thank you very much. Well, congratulations to Busu. And thank you very much, Michael, also for doing the honours. A nice uh, little um, unscheduled appearance by Elton John himself. Now, the next prize is awarded for complete multi-level English language courses for learners of any age. The courses we see this year don't just help students to become better readers, writers and speakers of English, which they already do very well. They also aim, aim to help students understand more about themselves, about others and about the world we live in, whilst also putting learning into the hands of the learners. This year, many of the finalists for this award aim to help students, adults, teenagers, uh, children to become well-rounded people, 360 degree uh, circumspection in order to help us address these very challenging times. The aim is to empower students to enter and to join any conversation in English, to say the right thing at the right time, minefield for native English speakers, let alone for people learning the language and to know the hidden rules of the real world English that we actually speak. Good luck with that. Also to teach socio-emotional skills, to give people intercultural awareness and an understanding of the big questions that affect all of us, but also impact us very differently according to our contexts. Some help students to learn values like empathy, sharing, helping others, creativity, critical and logical thinking values ever more important in this very unpredictable period of the 21st century. So to present this award, I'd like to welcome Catherine Whitaker, CEO of Eaton X, to present this award. Catherine. Thank you very much, Richard. It's my great pleasure to join you from my office here in London Bridge, which is very quiet at the moment. And hello, hello to all of you joining from all over the world. What a year it's been for our industry. We couldn't possibly have imagined when we met together at the Eltons in 2019 what the future would hold. At Eaton X, we experienced firsthand the enormous challenge of keeping learning going through our work with the British Council. We helped move their teaching centre lessons online and into our virtual platform but the pace and the scale of the crisis was at times overwhelming. I'm sure everyone today here has their own COVID stories to tell. So it's wonderful that despite all the upheaval of the pandemic, we have this chance today to come together and celebrate innovation, which has never been more important. Innovation in all its forms is what will keep us going through this crisis, whether it involves teaching through new technology, working collaboratively on a project that might just win an Elton in the future, or finding new protocols for keeping a language school open to students. I've always loved the way that the English language teaching world continually adapts and finds new ways to challenge and excite learners. And so I'm pleased to be able to share the finalists and reveal the winner of the Elton for Excellence in Course Innovation. And Kidsweb from Richmond, Literary Horizons Analysis and Essay Writing from Pearson ELT, New Magic Minds from The Learning Factory, The Wheels Series, Macmillan Education, and Wide Angle, Oxford University Press English Language Teaching in partnership with Blink. Good luck everyone. And the winner is New Magic Minds, Raquel Carlos, Carla Montenegro, Maria Eugenia Sanson, Luis Saguar, and Alessandra Libonati from Learning Factory. This is truly amazing. 
I've never been to the red carpet ceremony. But right now, let's like the Did you hear this crowd? Yes, there is a here. <laughs> and today, a big thank you goes to the team of wonderful people who's made this possible. So thank you, British Council, for this incredible opportunity and recognition and for persevering in putting up this online event. I'd like to thank the amazing Learning Factory team and incredibly talented and committed people who have designed, developed, and produced the new Magic Minds. My team knows I'm terrified of leaving names out, so I've chosen to name Carla Montenegro, the series editor here, half of the team, from our academic director to editors, authors, art, revision, digital content teams. Oh, they are invaluable. I am truly honored and privileged to work side by side with you. I'd also like to congratulate all the finalists that took part in this year's celebration. And I don't know if you're aware, but today we celebrate Teacher's Day here in Brazil. So I also need to thank the hundreds of teachers who bring new Magic Minds to life every day in their classrooms. I can only hope new Magic Minds will be a springboard for many of the memorable experiences we wish our kids have in the English language classroom. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Congratulations to Learning Factory. I was rather hoping we were going to get the Brazilian national anthem, which always um, enlivens the World Cup, because I think it's one of the longest national anthems in the world. It feels like a kind of middle period Verdi opera. Thank you also very much to Catherine for having presented the award. Now, our third award is the award for local innovation in partnership with Cambridge Assessment English. This award is all about overcoming challenges and finalists include we have a picture book from nigeria depicting the struggles of young people with hidden disabilities we have english and tamil bilingual storybooks designed to encourage young people in india to persevere with reading we have a first ever from sri lanka a science comic book which aims to well give something to tear people away from screen time and give access to books to others we have a course for preschoolers, which tackles bullying through growing the personal, social and emotional skills of very young learners. And in Brazil, again, very young learners grow their own edible gardens, sow the seeds literally, uh, and explore nature outside the classroom to learn principles of sustainability through the medium of English. So the Local Innovation Award, in partnership with Cambridge Assessment English, is given for resourcefulness where resources are limited, extra efforts where circumstances are particularly trying, and overcoming challenges to meet specific local needs. Entries were received from local projects we've heard, Brazil, India, Mexico, Nigeria, Singapore and Sri Lanka. And so to present this award I'd like to invite a highly esteemed partner to the British Council and to the Eltons to the stage. Would you please welcome Mercedes Moratorio, Director Americas of Cambridge Assessment English. Thanks, Richard. And hello to everyone around the world taking part in this year, Selton. As you said, I'm, I'm Mercedes Muratorio and I'm Director for Americas in Cambridge Assessment English. And this pandemic has caught me in Argentina, so I've been spending the last few months based in Buenos Aires, where, from where I am broadcasting today. I'm so sorry we can't all be together in person, but it's a real pleasure to be taking part in this important annual event that celebrates innovation in our sector. And I'm sure you will agree with me that if we were having an award for innovation in events, British Council will be the number one for, for this uh, category. Congrats to all our colleagues in British Council for such an amazing event so far. 
And today, my honor is to present the finalist in such an important category, local innovation. Innovations continue to unlock educational opportunities around the world, but it's particularly significant this year when we consider the disruption we've all faced. We've all seen firsthand just how technology and innovation can help us to rise above the unique challenges we've all faced in 2020. So I'd like to say thank you for everyone who took part this year. The standard is very high in this category, which must have made it a very difficult task for the judges. I'm pleased to be able to share the finalist and reveal the winner of the Elton for Local Innovation in partnership with Cambridge Assessment English. And the finalists are The Garden Project, Brazilian edition, Hoop Education in collaboration with Macmillan Brazil, Reading Genius, Bilingual Stories, Praham Books, Starfish, Pearson Educación de Mexico, Sciencepedia with Navoda Hura, National e Learning Center, University of Kelanya, Sri Lanka. I'm not naughty, I really, really mean it with the Winfrey Center for Children and Women, Lagos, Nigeria. Everybody, let's see who is the winner today. And for this category, the winner is The Garden Project, Brazilian edition, Angelica Manca, Hoop Education in collaboration with Macmillan Brazil. Fantastic. We are so happy and proud to be recipients of the Elton's Local Innovation Awards. The Garden Project Brazilian Edition is fruit of innovation and experience of having run the project in 17 countries and understanding the need to deliver a curriculum that is truly adapted to children's local reality. And amidst the climate changes and environmental disasters, the Garden Project seeks to create the balance, planting the seeds of, for a more sustainable future and reminding us of the importance of being connected with nature. It is a tribute, tribute to Mother Nature and that we all begin and end with her. So I'd like to thank the Brazilian team for being, for their insightfulness and bringing um, the understanding of Brazilian culture and um, seasonality, the flora, the fauna, and the Macmillan uh, Spain team as well, and the Vegetable Plot, our musical partners uh, that have really uh, uh, accompanied us uh, along the way. The teachers who, and, and school directors who believe in the project, and most importantly, the children. The children, of course. Who are nurturing knowledge that goes beyond uh, any kind of knowledge that we can impart. Thank you so much. Very many congratulations to our worthy winners and how timely because one of the things I think lots of us who've got the opportunity to access a garden or some outside space are found in lockdown is rediscovering exactly that, the kind of pulse of nature that underlies everything. It gets so often lost in urban experience. You should have seen my tomatoes, ladies and gentlemen, they were miraculous this year. Thank you also to Mercedes for uh, presenting the award. That was our third award, we come to our fourth now. And this is the award for innovation in learner resources. So this uh, award relates helping learners to get motivated and to stay motivated to learn, to find safe and supportive environments to do that learning in, to connect with others through learning and to enjoy learning, really important, to improve their skills, to develop skills also to study on their own, to realize their own potential, that's of course the, the great aim, to speak, write, read and listen in English 
and to learn vocabulary and grammar in English. It takes me back to my own experiences of learning, which, well, a long time ago now, although I'm fortunate, I've managed to kind of have lifelong but my schooling. I remember particularly uh, one of the most memorable teachers we ever had. He was a Welshman called Mr. Peters, and he was an English teacher. And he, more than anybody, put into my hands the tools to create an imagination uh, and an imaginative world with wide horizons that I could spend the rest of my life exploring. He was quite eccentric. We started with Chaucer, which he used to read to us in mellifluous Middle English. Juan Lataprilla, with his shoulders sort to the drocht of Marcha de Persa, to the right, I can still remember it now. But he'd been in the signals during the Second World War. When he got bored, which was quite often, he was a talented man. He used to go out of Middle English and into Morse code. So we get da 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 For some reason, I've always remembered it. Completely off syllabus, would never pass an Ofsted or any kind of government agency inspection. But he was the person who fired the imagination. For me, my imagination has never been more uh, lambently fired than by the English teachers who I had the good fortune to uh, to come across when I was learning and continue to learn. The next prize therefore celebrates materials that inform and entertain and that inspire and motivate English, English language learners of all ages. This year's finalists include those that are helping doctors to improve their handwriting at last and encouraging 10,000 Gen Zers to put down TikTok and actually speak to one another, imagine, with their webcam switched on and on Facebook of all places. So to announce this year's winner, do please welcome the Interim Chief Executive of English UK, Jodie Gray. Good afternoon, Richard, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody watching from around the world. I'm truly honoured to be presenting an award on the occasion of the Elton's 18th birthday and its first online edition. Congratulations to everybody involved. When I was browsing the finalists expo, and I encourage you to do the same, I was struck by the creativity, imagination and innovation in their diverse approaches to developing resources for learners. This reflects the huge diversity in the students who study English from around the world, young children and retirees, those looking to study English um, study at the British University, those looking to improve their career prospects, those with a passion for English literature, or simply those who love the language and want to use it as a tool to connect and build bridges. This must have been the most difficult decision for the judges. I don't envy them. I'm pleased to be able to share the finalists and reveal the winner of the Elton for Innovation in Learner Resources. The finalists are Pearson and BBC Live Classes, Pearson English, Real Lives Series, Ellie Publishing with Teres Desormes Italia, Viz Volunteer Service for Development, Action Aid Italia and GUS. Readable, Play Lingo with UFI Charitable Trust. Be Mindful, Elementary and Junior High. B Plus Live by Uno Internazionale. Dear Doctor, English Writing Skills for Clinical Practice and the Occupational English Test. Dr. Stephen J. Nicholas and Norman Whitby. Good luck, everybody. And the winner is Pearson and BBC Live Classes, Pearson English. Oh, thank you. That, that, that's really exciting. Um, I'm very pleased and honoured uh, to be accepting the award for the project that represents great passion for learning all over the world, which generates engagement and motivation for learning, um, and which is 
accessible to every teenage learner across, across the globe, whether they live in a big city or in a small town, whether they learn in class or online. Pearson and BBC Live Classes is a worldwide community of learners and educators who support and motivate each other, stay in touch and keep the experience live and meaningful outside the classroom. So let me say thank you to all the students and teachers who are coming together with us and build this community with passion for learning. I know many of them are watching us today and I know how proud they are to be a part of this project. At this stage, let me also acknowledge many important people who put a lot of creativity, engagement and passion into making this project possible. So thank you to Michael Brandt for being a creative and supportive partner from day one. Jane Forrest, a great advocate and supporter, our excellent trainers, my live classes committee, and all my colleagues in Pearson across the globe. And finally, let me say thank you to our unique partner, the BBC Studios, for providing authentic, extremely motivating video content that make each lesson unique. Thank you very much. This is very exciting. I'm really proud of this award. Very many congratulations to uh, Pearson's and BBC. And thank you very much, Jody, also for doing the honours. Um, our next award, which is the fifth award, is the Award for Innovation in Teacher Resources. One of the things that I think has struck me most forcefully in these extraordinary few months, which I've experienced uh, in England, I'm sure it's um, comparable experience around the world, has been the willingness with which we've um, wanted to, well, on Thursday night at eight o'clock at the height of lockdown in England, it became a, a custom for everyone to stand out in the street, socially distanced, of course, but to applaud, to bang tin cans, to saucepans, to clap their hands together, to applaud the work of the National Health Service, our health workers in the front line of dealing with that first terrible onslaught of coronavirus and those who were sick with it. And it was a reminder um, of just how much we owe people whose everyday heroism is no less heroic for not being often observed and not always being properly rewarded and acknowledged. So it's really important for us to come out. And it, I think it really touched people, moved people very deeply to be able to do that. And we heard fantastic stories from the front line. But of course, it's not just about health workers, is it? It occurs to me that another front line was that that was maintained by teachers, absolutely essential workers. Um, I'm a governor of a primary school here in my parish. I'm also the chancellor of a university, the University of Northampton. And it was fantastic to be involved in projects both locally and at the university, which I think demonstrated so many of the virtues of what teachers do. Their commitment to ensure the very best um, to enable the development and the flourishing of children and young people and learners of all ages. Um, knowing their communities, really, really important, understanding where the dynamics are in a particular community. In this community, it's the church, we had a bit of land that had been sitting there doing nothing. We managed to sort of settle a dispute over ownership and we sold it to developers and they built some houses and we got a chunk of money. And with that money, we um, funded an educational charity because it was obvious to us that the children from the poorer ends of this particular parish, local community, were not doing as well when they arrived in school as children from the richer parts of this community. They weren't as engaged with learning, they weren't as engaged with literacy in particular. So we funded a nursery school so that children before they got into school and before the measurements that were going to dictate the future course of their lives were made, that they were already able to compete more levelly. We're just now beginning to see that pay out. And credit again to the dedication of teachers who've been able to do that, who've been able to provide those children with the necessary uh, learning uh, and imaginative stimulus to do that. At the university, again, um, we used to put an awful lot of effort and creativity and imagination into creating blended learning models. This is, of course, stuff you know very, very well. But um, as lockdown made it impossible for us to interface and interact with our students as we normally would, um, we had to put a lot of resources into that. We've just built a new campus, a £350 million pound campus, and we were able to build into that the technology that uh, made that uh, 
easy to happen. Well, it was easy, but we worked out how to use it. We were also able to mobilize the resources of the university in helping to uh, support the local effort. For example, our halls of residence not being occupied by students, we were able to debate, devote to people who were coming to the hospital because they had relatives in the hospital, needed somewhere to stay, and also to um, healthcare workers and to people in the emergency services. So they had uh, resources too. It's not just about material resources though, is it? So much of these battles are thought on a battlefield which is actually of the imagination because you have to give people vision. You have to give people a sense of where they're going. You have to stimulate the dynamics in them which precisely ignite their creativity and their imagination because uh, so much of where the battle is fought is fought on those fronts. So that's been um, a very interesting thing to do. You may think I'm filling and you're right because we're not quite sure we're able to get up uh, yet the um, person who's going to give the next award. Let me tell you a little bit about that. And that is, uh, here we go. Is this the, I'm sorry, I'm going to is this the judge's commendation for equality, diversity and inclusion? Or this is the award for innovation and teacher resources. Yes, it's the innovation for teachers award. How are we doing? Are we able to connect to um, our donor? Do not forget, not even for a second, that you own the flesh that pushes against your skin in a constant rhythm, reminding you to dance with life. Even when the kiss of a warmer climate slowly migrates from tinted cheeks and winter, wherever you are, pulls your palette under its icy paintbrush, I hope that you were smart enough to lock at least a fistful of sun behind your ribs. I hope you blinked a Santorini sunset deep into your face to be seen again on the inside of your lids. If ever, that is, you should hope to remember how beautiful a life it is when we spread our laughter across plate boundaries like a tide, pulling the world closer, despite humans' best efforts to scratch cracks across the globe. I hope you know that, like dust, what sits under these fault lines is only a breath of fresh air, something new to experience, something to add to our collection of feelings. Yes, across the stretch of the clouds underneath we are different, but how marvelous it is to move 500 miles and still throw chins to the stars and marvel at how moving the sky can be when performed to the faint sound of a new language. A new laugh pulls from your lips into your living room, rebounding off the laptop screen to be laughed again as you watch your holiday archives. And you again wonder, who on earth told you that that hat goes with that dress? But there is something about unfolding ourselves into maps to be stamped like passports by new ways of thinking and living and eating and dressing and drinking and opening to how many ways a country can stain your skin Okay, sure, right now we're locked in, but luckily we're in the age of smartphones. So go to your holiday album, print out some photos, watch a telenovela, try to sing along to the intro, switch over to Nollywood, see some West African clothes, maybe order some jollof or gizzard, close the curtain, ignore the blizzard, T turn your heating up and pretend to be by the coast, tuck your toes into a throat and change the way that you scroll. Maybe like a few photos from friends that you met on the road. Follow it up by calling their phone, send voice notes instead of messages. Remember how their voice would croak when they spoke. Use words instead of emojis. Find a way to express those feels. Although we're becoming more intimate with the internet, we can't afford to swap flesh for steel. Balance the news with documentaries, then turn them both off and read a book. <laughs> Close those pages and take a look at the sky. And as you take a look at the sky, trust. Trust that 
across 1,000 miles. The stars have stolen over 7 billion eyes. And despite distance and difference, we all smile at the same sun. Now more than ever before, we must lean into that connection to protect whoever humanity decides to become. Well, this is Award 5, and it's the Award for Innovation in Teacher Resources. We're very sorry we're not able to actually connect to uh, our award giver, who is Professor Rama Matthew, who's in Delhi, but for technical reasons, we can't do that. So it falls to me to um, announce the winner. And the winner of the Innovation in Teacher Resources is the ELT Footprint Community, Daniel Barber, Catherine Billsborough, Christopher Graham, and Kerry Jones, the ELT Footprint community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Thank you to the British Council and to the Elton's team for organising this year's event and thank you to the judges who voted for us. It was already an honour for ELT Footprint to be a finalist and I'd like to congratulate our co-finalists on their excellent and innovative products. I can't say I am 100% surprised at winning because let's face it, the climate emergency is the most important issue facing the entire world right now. And it's high time our profession played its part in saving the planet. All of the 3000 plus members of our community know this and this award is for each and every one of them. Thank you. Today we pause to celebrate, but tomorrow it's back to action. We have a moral obligation to do whatever we can within our ELT sphere. There are lots of conversations to be had and lots more innovative ideas to be developed and shared. ELT Footprint is the perfect place for this. I'd like to end by inviting everyone out there to join us if you haven't already. Everyone is welcome. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Congratulations to a very worthy winner. And apologies then for um, technical confusion. As you can imagine, trying to shrink the world in this kind of way presents um, some difficult challenges. We don't always succeed, but uh, very, very glad we we're able to get that award to its rightful home. Now, the sixth award, even more technical challenges because I've got to use an internet clicker, which I've never done before. So if the world's power grid should go down, it's probably because of me, fingers crossed. This uh, award six is new, and it's the judge's commendation for equality, diversity, and inclusion, three of the watchwords of our time. And it was thought particularly timely because this is the 18th anniversary, the coming of age, if you like, uh, of the Eltons, and so the British Council has introduced this new award. During the selection of the finalists, the Eltons judges could also choose to give special commendation to those finalists that showed serious consideration and action to bridge inequality in education, to reflect diversity, and to include groups who traditionally have been excluded in English language teaching. Really important thing. I think one of the uh, can, people often wonder what are the continuities between having been in a pop band in the 1980s and being a vicar now. And actually, one of them is this thing about inclusion. It's about trying to ensure that you engage and involve and make yourselves accessible to as many people as possible. It's very easy, isn't it? I think in complacency to forget that there are people both at the margins of our worlds and our concerns and beyond those whose voices are not always heard. And one of the lessons we've had in recent years when much more effort has been put into widening um, the horizons of inclusion is just how valuable those voices have been because often they'll tell you things that you naturally won't hear because the mainstream drone has a kind of drowning out effect and sometimes it's those oblique and it's those angled voices from the edges uh, that'll tell you 
uh, the really important information. Now, from among all of the fine lists across the five categories we've just, um, we've just uh, seen, it's now my great honour to announce the recipients of the commendation for the first time. I get the golden envelope. And folks, the recipients of the Elton's Judges Equality Commendation are Dyslexia Bites from Martin Bloomfield, an online library building an understanding of dyslexia necessary for every teacher to understand as many as the 15% of their students who may have it. I am not naughty, I really, really mean it. You will find those words engraved on my heart, but it's actually the name of the project. Um, by Bazirat Razak Shuaib with the Winford Centre for Children and Women in Nigeria. It's a children's picture book depicting the struggles young children with hidden disabilities can have, <clears throat> teaching empathy, disability awareness and inclusion. <coughs> Journey to Basic Skills, Click to Learn with City College Glasgow a universally accessible online English course for complete beginners designed to meet the needs of the more than 700 million adults affected by illiteracy. Kids Web by Richmond. This course includes a disabled character and accompanying puppet to help teachers increase young learners' awareness of disability and foster inclusion and respect. Real Lives series from ELI Publishing and Partners. Original reading books which take the stories of real children from around the world to help young learners understand the lives of children from other countries and cultures. The No Project, the No Project with the Rights Lab, Nottingham University, a global education campaign against human trafficking and modern slavery, providing free English teaching resources based on true stories handled with dignity, sensitivity, and respect. And congratulations to all those commended for equality, diversity, and inclusion. Well done, everyone. And well done me for not crashing the national grid with my clicker. The seventh award, the Eltras English Language Teaching Research Awards and Best Master's Dissertation Award. So that's uh, two. These two awards uh, give us an opportunity to recognise the researchers and institutions that look at how English is taught around the world. Over the last 12 years, 41 UK universities, uh, universities have received funding to run 79 research projects worldwide, many working with overseas researchers and teachers. Most recently, research projects were selected on how to survive the first year of teaching, on well-being in the refugee language classroom, and on a review decade of teaching English to young learners. Research is published to be open access on the British Council's Teaching English website. Each year we also invite UK universities to put forward their single best master's dissertation at distinction level. Runners up and winners are selected based on their potential for impact on English language policy or teaching practice. It is with great pleasure that I can announce this year's master's dissertation winner. And it is Paige Wheeler at University College London for their dissertation, The Effect of Vowel Accuracy visual speech and iconic gesture on intelligibility, supported by Kazuya Saito, PhD, Associate Professor in Applied Linguistics. Our very warmest congratulations to Paige. We look forward to publishing your dissertation on the British Council Teaching English website. And now to the final award of the Elton's 2020, and this is the award for Outstanding Achievement.
Well, this award honors members of the global English language teaching community who've made an impact on shaping English language education around the world. Nominations for this award are open to the public and were put forward by many of you joining us today. From 79 nominations, the panel of judges undertook the nearly impossible task of shortlisting and voting for a single winner to be announced tonight, today, this morning, whatever. So to present the award, I welcome to the stage Janet Enever, Professor Emerita, the Mayo University in Sweden and visiting professor at my alma mater, King's College London. Thank you, Richard, and greetings to everyone from my home here in Brighton in these interesting virtual times. I'm really thrilled to be able to present the award for outstanding achievement to someone who has been deeply committed to supporting young children learning English around the world for more than 60 years now, a truly outstanding achievement. If I mention that two guiding themes have led her work, very young children, and a love of story through sharing picture books. Young learner specialists amongst you already may have guessed. The winner of this year's award for outstanding achievement is Opal Dunn. She is, I have to say, quite a unique person. A passion for early years education acquired during her days as a student and a teacher in the 1950s at the Froebel Foundation College which is now part of the University of Roehampton, where Opal learned about the important role of kindergartens in children's early language learning. As a pioneer in the field of early language learning, her first truly outstanding initiative was taken during a period of nine years spent in Japan, where she worked with Japanese mothers to establish mother and child groups gathering in their homes to share picture books in English. By the time Opal left Tokyo in 1980, there were 50 mini libraries known as Bunko groups across Japan, operating in English, French and German. And to date, over 14,000 children have used the library. Her work continued when she returned to the UK, establishing more Bunko groups to support bilingual families wanting to maintain their children's links with Japanese through sharing picture books. This tremendous achievement was acknowledged by the Japanese government in 2008, awarding Opal the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Rays for her outstanding contribution to international education for Japanese children. Opal was way ahead of her time in this, a pioneer in recognizing the importance of nurturing children's multilingual identities. Opal has also been a prolific author with around 100 picture books for children and information books and articles for parents, including the British Council's Learn English Parents booklets. In the 1980s, she wrote two of the first handbooks for teachers of English to young children, published by Macmillan, and these have recently been updated and published by Collins. The next great adventure for Opal was the founding of the Ayatefel Young Learner Special Interest Group in 1985. 35 years later today, the Special Interest Group has a significant global presence, publishing a journal, organizing conferences and online seminars for teachers and teacher educators around the world, a really important lifeline for teachers. Forever an in innovator, Opal recognized teachers and parents' interest in the potential for using picture books to support children learning English. Perhaps her most precious gift to the profession was the launch of Real Book News in 1987. And here's one of the front covers of it. it was, she self-published this and distributed it twice yearly as a news sheet, totally self-funded with some 50 editions altogether. The publication provided guidance on a wealth of wonderful picture books and helped to establish picture books as an important part of both kindergarten and primary English language learning. At a more personal level, Opal has generously supported many teachers, providing them with picture books to use in their classrooms and sponsoring research projects in Hungary, Poland, Portugal and the UK and probably other countries I don't know about. 
all investigating the use of picture books with children learning English. Again, a self-funded initiative. I could continue with more stories of Opal's commitment, but time is running out. So I'll conclude by saying that throughout her distinguished career, Opal has done so much to guide and inspire parents and teacher educators in her efforts to ensure that the next generation of children grow up with a love of stories, recognizing that there is so much to be understood and learned about life through enjoying narratives communicated in both pictures and text. She is indeed a worthy recipient of the Elton's Award for Outstanding Achievement in Shaping English Language Teaching and Learning Around the World. And now I must close because there are a few more colleagues who would like to say something tonight. Opal, congratulations on this award that you so wholly deserve. You've touched the lives of so many children and you've touched my life. Congratulations, Opal. Your vision 35 years ago has shaped IATEFL YLTSIG into the global community that it is today. Opal's work has been quite literally transformative in the way we approach teaching English to young children today. Opal Dunn was one of the first to work with bilingual Japanese children. She understood they could self-educate and continue growing their English fluency in a feel-good informal English mini-library community called Bunko. 43 years later, Bunko exists worldwide. Thanks to her real book news and her great support, I have been able to use picture books and share them with pre-service and in-service teachers and most importantly, with young learners for over 20 years. Opal has been a stellar guide to a whole generation of young learner teachers, trainers and authors following in her footsteps, including myself. Through your books for children and adults, lectures and workshops, the wonderful Bunko program, your contributions to the field of bilingualism and education are countless. Thank you, Opal, for raising the status of teaching languages to children and of using picture books in ELT. You, you wear many hats, and one of which is a picture book creator yourself, and I remember you saying that to hold and enjoy some picture books should be one of children's rights. I couldn't agree with you more, and you never lose sight of that vital link between the child, the home, and the school. You've been a great inspiration to me, Opal, and I can't tell you how delighted I am that you are honoured with this award. Opal, I thank you for all the contributions to Nurse Rebelled over the years, and I salute your curiosity, your energy, and your commitment to young children and their families. Congratulations on this award. Opal Dunn's work has been extremely influential for EFL teachers and researchers, and her passion for picture books has been a continuing source of professional inspiration. I've known and respected this lady for more than 40 years. Inspirational, knowledgeable and enormous fun. Very well deserved. Ambassador, and I would like to express our heartfelt congratulations to Mrs. Opaldan, who has dedicated herself to English education for Japanese children here and in Japan. Her endeavor has been recognized by the Japanese government as well. We're thankful for her exceptional role in bridging Japan and the UK. At the beginning of my picture book career, when I had nothing but enthusiasm, she treated me as an equal. Thank you, Opal. Congratulations, Opal. I think you are a picture book beautifully illustrated and the positive, creative pages of your life have brought the magic of books and language learning to children everywhere. Thank you for everything and well done. For anyone who teaches young learners, Opal's like a mother to us. She began us, then she nurtured us to where we are today. Opal's amazing. Thank you everyone for this award. I confess I was completely surprised and thank you for your messages today. I feel humble and honored, but I would like to consider this award as a recognition of the unique and important role played by early years English teachers in the holistic development of young children. Ask an adult 
who was your favorite English teacher? And their reply is likely to be their very first teacher. They may add her or his name and even proudly recite a poem. They learned in the English class. Successful English years teachers are enablers. They're not instructors. There is something unique about the way early years teachers plan enabling activities. They set the scene and mediate in ways that the child can unconsciously work out how to transfer their home self-language learning strategies in order to absorb and understand another content, and that's English. You could hear them boast, I can speak two languages when they are spoken to, but they could only spoke, uh, speak, sorry, limited like, uh, English, but they can understand much more than they say. Young lang learners self-acquire spoken English in the way they acquire their home language. It is not a taught subject by adults like reading and writing. To acquire language, a teacher's role is that of enabler, providing different activities supported by parents. Using her tone of voice, the teacher manages and moderates, including back and forth, chats and some playful voice to add some fun. In sharing these activities, the child absorbs some of the teacher's attitudes and interests. World educators recognize an absorbent period up to the age of seven or eight, when the unconscious mind dominates and facilitates copying and acquisition of informal types of language used in meaningful activities. Early teachers know about that. During the absorbent period, children can self-educate from enabling mini projects that start from children's interests and take them beyond the real and beyond and into real world situations, including some where this English is spoken on screen. In other words, through enabling experiences, the early years teacher's role is also that of global educator sowing seeds. To quote the Nobel Prize winner novelist Kazuo Ishigoro, many of our deepest motives come not from adult logic of how things work in the world, but out of something that is frozen from early childhood. Thank you. Well, congratulations to Opal, what an extraordinary achievement. Well, so many extraordinary achievements that we've been celebrating and marking today. Thank you so much, everyone, for everything you have done to make it possible. I started by talking about that sense of about where for me uh, it begins, which was this extraordinary moment when somebody decided that you could write things on a page and bind them in a book, stick them on a donkey and send them out along the trade routes of the Eastern Mediterranean out into the world and the impact that the arrival of that language saying that thing, it was Greek, of course, uh, had was extraordinary. What's also extraordinary it occurred to me um, as I've been following events uh, at this event has been what comes back to you, of course, because it's not just a one-way street, that is it, it's a dynamic relationship, and what goes out sets up an echo, and that comes back, and that changes what you started out being anyway. And that's such an extraordinarily rich experience, and it's a sort of model, that two-way exchange, that dynamic relationship between what you transmit and what you receive, from the broadcaster speaking, um, just what that does to you, how that kind of thrills to you, captivates you, uh, fires up your imagination and creates new worlds. 
not always easy to measure that kind of stuff. And we live in an era of, I think, crude metrics when perhaps the things which seem to get the most attention and accrue the most value are the things which figure most readily in a crude metric. But there are subtle metrics too, harder to trace, but no less um, persuasive. In fact, in ways, a lot more persuasive when you see what the effect of that firing up of the imagination and that stimulation and that stretching of the imaginative horizons can do to people. That's what you do. And it's a really remarkable thing. And I think we should all stand out in the street and clap you. But anyway, you know who you are. Thank you um, so much for everything you've done. That's quite enough for me. I'd like to hand over for the close to Mark Robson. Many, many thanks, Richard, and a big hello to everyone wherever you're watching from. So the job of the closing speaker at the Eltons is traditionally to direct people to the bar. Sadly, I can't do that today, but I can direct you to some other fun-packed activities in which you might want to partake. But before I do that, a few words of congratulations and of thanks. First of all, huge congratulations to all today's winners and finalists. To get this far, you have all got through many rounds of rigorous judging and should all rightly feel very proud of your achievements. The innovation and creativity in this industry never ceases to amaze me. Next, a huge debt of gratitude goes to the Elton's judges for the time and expertise you've each put in to ensure that we have such worthy finalists and winners. Along with that, a big thank you to our amazingly professional award presenters today. A special mention for our Elton's partner in crime, Cambridge Assessment English. We're once again incredibly grateful for your support in putting on these awards. A huge thank you, of course, to the British Council Elton's team who have swept blood and tears to put on our very first virt virtual Elton's. And last but not least, our genuine thanks once again to our brilliant host this evening, the Reverend Richard Coles. Thank you to all our huge online audience for taking the time to join us today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. As promised, and as some compensation for not being able to usher you into the bar, I invite those of you watching on the Elton's official platform to another first, the Elton's virtual networking reception. True to the spirit of the Elton's, this is a brand new and innovative way to connect with fellow attendees. And there are two ways. One, if you're feeling brave enough, you can take a chance and have a three minute encounter with a fellow attendee chosen for you, especially through AI, artificial intelligence matchmaking. Give it a try in the one-to-one -one matchmaking area to the left of your screen. Or two, alternatively, you can catch up with any of the finalists or anyone else attending simply by going to the people tab to the right of your screen and invite them to a video call. The finalist expo will also stay open so you can learn more about the finalists and winners. So thank you once again, and I'm sure if Richard was still here at this point, he would say, or perhaps sing, don't leave me this way. And indeed I won't. And I'm pleased to play out this year's Elton's with the very special Elton's 2020 poem, once again, written and read by Sophia Thakur. Thank you. Do not forget, not even for a second, that you own the flesh that pushes against your skin in a constant rhythm, reminding you to dance with life. Even when the kiss of a warmer climate slowly migrates from tinted cheeks and winter, wherever you are, pulls your palette under its icy paintbrush, I hope that you are smart enough to lock at least a fistful of sun behind your ribs. I hope you blink to Santorini's sunset deep into your face to be seen again on the inside of your lids. If ever, that is, you should hope to remember how beautiful a life it is when we spread our laughter across plate boundaries like a tide, pulling the world closer, despite humans' best efforts to scratch cracks across the globe. I hope you know that, like dust, what sits under these fault lines is only a breath of fresh air, something new to experience, 
Something to add to our collection of feelings, yes, across the stretch of the clouds underneath we are different, but how marvellous it is to move 500 miles and still throw chins to the stars and marvel at how moving the sky can be when performed to the faint sound of a new language. A new laugh pulls from your lips into your living room, rebounding off the laptop screen to be laughed again as you watch your holiday archives. And you again wonder, who on earth told you that that hat goes with that dress? But there is something about unfolding ourselves into maps to be stamped like passports by new ways of thinking and living and eating and dressing and drinking and opening to how many ways a country can stain your skin. Okay, sure, right now we're locked in, but luckily we're in the age of smartphones. So go to your holiday album, print out some photos, Watch a telenovela, try to sing along to the intro. Switch over to Nollywood, see some West African clothes. Maybe order some jollof or gizzard. Close the curtain, ignore the blizzard. T turn your heating up and pretend to be by the coast. Tuck your toes into a throat and change the way that you scroll. Maybe like a few photos from friends that you met on the road. Follow it up by calling their phone, send voice notes instead of messages. Remember how their voice would croak when they spoke. Use words instead of emojis. Find a way to express those feels. Although we're becoming more intimate with the internet, we can't afford to swap flesh for steel. Balance the news with documentaries. Then turn them both off and read a book. <laughs> Close those pages and take a look at the sky. And as you take a look at the sky, trust. Trust that across 1,000 miles, the stars have stolen over 7 billion eyes. And despite distance and difference, we all smile at the same sun. Now more than ever before, we must lean into that connection to protect whoever humanity decides to become. <laughs>